bottom of that page, there's a link to some other videos. And that's where the one for what is FLL. It should have been on that first page, but they didn't put it there for whatever reason. So it's a long way to get there. But it's only a short video, but it shows a little bit about each activity that you're going to be seeing and explains what it is that's going on. So that gives you a really short overview. You should view that with your whole team so they can see what to expect. Each team should have one of these packets to check in. So I'm going to be working from these. My name is Leroy Nelson. I'm the operational partner for the Los Angeles region. So part of what you're going to do is you're going to do some research. You're either going to go online and look at online resources and find out what's being done about the problem that you're interested in, or you're going to need to go talk to some experts and find out what's already being done about that particular problem and try to come up with something creative that's not already being done. And kids come up with some amazing ideas when they do this project. It got to be such a big deal that we decided to have another contest. After the projects are all done and all the tournaments are all done, the teams that came up with really great ideas submit them to our Global Innovation Award contest. Now, it just so happens that the current president of FIRST came from his prior job was being the head of the U.S. Patent and Trade Office. So he happens to know all the people who do patents, and he knows lots of patent lawyers. So he gets them to come and volunteer to review all of these ideas that were submitted for the Global Innovation Award. They're all ideas that FIRST Lego League teams came up with. They're creative solutions. And that group of professional patent reviewers picks one each year that they think, wow, this would be something that we would give a patent. In fact, we will give a patent. They give a patent to that idea, and then they give them $10,000 to try to make it into a real product. So this year they couldn't decide between two teams. They had two really good ideas, so they gave both of them $10,000 and gave them both patents. So kids, and these are things that kids have to do. Now keep in mind, adults are not allowed to contribute. None of the adult ideas are supposed to be involved in this. This is all kids' ideas. Adults provide structure, discipline, organization, no ideas. This is all kids' ideas. Same thing for the robot, all kids' ideas. You can help them solve a problem that they need help with, but they need to come up with the ideas themselves, the strategy and the programs, all that. All right, so the steps are you interview somebody, you talk to them about their problems, all the kids get together, you pick one problem that you all want to work on. You're going to go do some research on it, either online or talk to a professional or both, and you're going to pick a creative solution to that problem, something that isn't being done by a lot of other folks already, and then you're going to pick some group and present what you've done so far. Now, who you pick, that really can be anybody, but our recommendation is if you really want to do the best job here and get the best benefit for it, go pick somebody who would actually be able to implement your idea, who would be affected by it. So it depends on what you pick, but if you pick something that was a medical problem, then maybe you would want to go present it to a doctor or a nurse and then see what they think about your idea, see if it really is as creative as you think it is, and maybe they can give you some other suggestions on how you can make it even better. You can use ideas from professionals that you talk to, but you can't use traditional parent ideas. That has to be all the kids doing it, either talking to a consultant or doing their own research. The things that they get from an expert, that's fair. All right, so now we've gone through the four steps, or three steps, four steps so far. You talk to a senior citizen, you identified a problem, you came up with a creative solution, and you presented it to some group. It could even be an individual. It could be a principal. You can't come in with any other idea. Somebody you presented to. Now, you've got this whole four steps that you've gone through. You need to come up with a creative presentation that you're going to give to the judges when you go to an event. So, 
your presentation should convey all the steps that you went through and all the information about that, but it also has to be entertaining to the judges. It has to hold their attention. It has to be live. You can't just videotape something and show them the videotape. It has to be a live presentation. Now, one thing I need to warn you about is some of the places where you go, you, you've got to make this up here. You can come up here. Um, some places where you go, um, the facilities aren't really optimal. There's a teacher workroom that you'll be in, and there'll be a vending machine right there. And if you've got an old judge like wood, they have rigid insulation material that you can buy at Home Depot or any place where you're going to go get your lumber. And it's actually cheaper, and it's a whole lot lighter. Instead of having a table that weighs 14, 15 pounds, you can build a table that only weighs 4 pounds. All right? it's, it's a little softer. It's not as rigid as the wood, and so you have to be a little more careful in handling it to keep it from getting dented up. But I have one in the car. I didn't bring it. I should have brought it in. But you can cut it in half, put some duct tape across the joint on the back, fold it just like a hinge. So now you've got a table that will fit in half the space. You can carry it with one hand, carry it like this with one hand, and, um, and it works great. Now, there's assembly required in either case. This one requires a little bit more assembly because you need to buy a sheet of material, a 4 by 8 sheet, and you're going to cut it into 2 and a half inch strips to make the walls around the outside. And that means that the end pieces are going to be a little ragged on the top. You can put the smooth edges on the outside edge. There are always two smooth edges on the sheet, but the ones on the ends are going to be a little ragged. So what I did, and it's, and it's an option, but in order to make it look nice and to have nice smooth edges, you can, while you're at the store buying that foam insulation board, you buy uh, uh, the, the contact tape, black contact tape buy a whole rolls. So I bought two rolls of it and that was enough to put over all of the, the walls. So it looks like it's just the same as the as the painted ones. When you go to official tournament, those are all going to be painted black. Okay, not just bare wood. And if you put the contact paper over, it just looks like the ones of wood. You can't really tell unless you get up close that it was foam instead of wood. But it's a whole lot lighter. Now you do have that little ledge right in the middle where the two come together and it may not join exactly perfectly, but the robot doesn't really have any problem with that unless you try to turn right on top of it. It might interfere a little bit with some robot design, but if you design it right, and I'll explain how to do that in a minute, it really doesn't have any effect on you at all. All right, so that's your table. You'll need to have a table to practice on. Now you don't actually have to build the whole table you could just have walls and, and work on a smooth floor, like a, a wood or an oleum or something like that. And just put your mat on the floor and have walls around the outside. Kids don't mind that, uh, but for adults it's kind of inconvenient to get down on the floor and work with the mat on the floor. We like it up on the table. Now when we go to tournaments, our ideal height for the table is 24 inches. We do that so that the youngest kids can reach across the table and grab their robots and also so that if there are any kids on wheelchairs, they can reach across the table and grab their robot. So uh, a normal table is going to be 29 or 30 inches tall. So it's a little taller than what we try to have at tournaments. But some tournaments don't have anything 24 inches tall to put it on. Uh, the construction suggests using uh, sawhorses, but most of those are 30 inches instead of 24, so it's hard to find anything that's 24 inches tall. The reason they use sawhorses is so that a wheelchair can slide up to the table and get under it uh, and not have a leg right at the, right at the corner. Uh, but it also provides some hazard in that you can bump into it if it's not as stable as if it's on four legs. What I use in Manhattan Beach and, and at the championship, uh, our schools have uh, stage risers. They're four by eight platforms, aluminum that's got carpet on the top, and then they have post legs that are interchangeable for different lengths. So we put 24-inch legs into them, 
and then they form a really solid surface that people could stand on if you wanted to, but we just put tables on top of them, and they're really sturdy. They don't move. Uh, even if you bump into them, they're going to stay where they are. It, they're very heavy when we set it up. It's a lot of work to set them up, but once we put them someplace, they stay. Now, I'll talk about the field map. When you order your field setup kit, how many people have built their have not built their field setup kit yet? Let's try that. How many people have not built the field setup kit? We still have one. This is the first year the field setup kit didn't come with a huge long tube for the mat to be in because the mat material up until last year, if you put creases into it by folding it up like this, you would never get them out. They would be there forever. All right, but this mat material does unwind a little bit, but uh, if it's if you're doing it inside and it never gets up to the kind of temperature we got here today. You, it may never get completely uh, uncreased. Um, some of the events you go to, they may not have had their mats unfolded and done what it takes to get the creases out. So if I were running a team, I always want to plan for the worst contingency. The worst contingency is you could go to a tournament and it might have bad creases on the mat. So what I think I would do in practicing is I would just leave the creases in. Unfold it, put it on the table, and play with it just like that. You're never going to see a map worse than that. Some will be good, and it won't bother your robot. If there are no pieces, your robot will just run just fine. But if there are pieces, you're going to have to take that into account when you're doing your programming, and you're going to pick some paths that probably don't do turns right on top of the piece. So if you think about that while you're planning your robot, make pathways that do turns when you're not on top of the crease, then no matter where you go, you'll be fine. Because the robot will be able to drive over a crease and it won't bother it. So when it's turning, they don't have a problem. Yes? If you design your robot to work with creases, will it work equally well without creases? Well, you can try that and see. But my hypothesis is that if you design it for creases, it's going to work much better without creases than if you design it without pieces and then try to run it on pieces. So I've had it where it works too well and it just overshoots everything. That's, that's For example, with battery problems. That's a concern. So you might want to try it, programming it with the pieces and then try it without, see what happens is different. Um, so if you wanted to get rid of the pieces, we have discovered, they haven't posted it online yet, but we have discovered a way that works a lot better than what they said. The instructions online say, use a hair dryer on the back side of the mat and warm it up and then lay it down and the creases will go away. But here in Lancaster, that's probably not a problem. You just set it outside for a couple of hours in the sun and it probably takes care of all your creases all by itself. Uh, but uh, now down in Manhattan Beach, it never gets this hot, so we need an air dryer. But that's way more work than you actually need to do. We found another way to do it. Just take the mat out, roll it up really tightly in a roll, and then just let it sit for a while. And then unroll it and roll it the opposite way. And then let it just sit for a while, a day or two, you know, overnight. And the, the way you roll it last is with the picture on the outside. And then when you unroll it, the, the ends will curl down and it'll just kind of lie down flat. If you left, if the last time you rolled it tightly was with the picture on the inside, when you put it on your table, the ends are going to want to curl up. Okay? But if the last time you roll it is with the picture on the outside, then when you unroll it, it'll still lay down flat and the wrinkles are 90% or better gone. Okay? Just by doing that twice. All right. Now, for those that haven't built your field setup kit yet, you've got lots of little bags of parts, and you've got lots of different models to build. Unfortunately, there's almost no correlation. So, and some of the parts are tiny, right? Lots of little tiny parts, and they're round. They roll like crazy. So, my recommendation is don't just work on a table, because if you do, you're going to lose something. They're going to roll off the table, they're going to roll across the floor, and they're going to hide under the refrigerator or something, and you're just not going to be able to find anything. So, save yourself the trouble, get yourself a big bath towel, neutral color, doesn't happen to be the same as any of the colors of the pieces in your kit, okay? 
and lay that out on the table and work on that. Open up all the bags, dump them out, try to get similar things together. Move all the big pieces out of the way, like there's a whole bunch of these big black things. Stack them up together out of the way. There's a whole bunch of these beams, the red beams, and they're all different lengths. 15, 13, 11, 9, 7, 5, 3, okay? Sort them. Pull them out, sort them. All the 15s, all the 13s, they'll save you a lot of heat later on, okay? The instructions of how to do the building all come on here, all right? And if you print it out, printing it on a black and white printer isn't going to help you. So if you do print them out at all, you want to print it out on a color printer, and that would allow you to have multiple kids working on different pieces of the model at one time. Or you could copy the the CD onto your computer, and you could have several computers if you wanted to have multiple people doing it. But uh, the instructions, the reason they're so long is the instructions are very detailed. They show you for a particular model what it's going to look like when you're done. And then they take two or three pieces, like this says one gray, start with that, take two of these that are medium gray and two of these that are medium gray, and shows you where to put them on the picture, All right. and then you go to the next step. So it's adding a few pieces each time, and it shows you exactly where they go to build up the whole model. Now, without, if you didn't print it in color, it would be really hard to tell where the pieces go, because they all kind of will blend together. And uh, you need to watch carefully, because there's a dark gray and a medium gray and a black, and they tend to look a lot alike on these pictures. So they always tell you what the color is. Make sure you've got the right color. Because there's differences in how they operate. Some of the pieces have bigger holes in them than others, or bigger shafts than others on the little pins. And they're meant to be able to rotate freely or not to be able to rotate freely. And if you use the wrong one, then the piece won't operate correctly. Okay? So you need to make sure you're using the right ones. All right, and the, finally, the last piece that comes in the kit is dual lock. And I accidentally left my dual lock out in Santa Maria yesterday. So I have to get it to send it back to me. But I've got some left over from the other models that I built. So you get two sheets of this. It's sort of like Velcro, but it doesn't have any hooks and loops. What it has instead is little knobs on the ends of little plastic pieces. And when you push it together, those little knobs go past each other, and then they lock. You can hear it when you snap it together. I get one to do it for you. challenge instructions come out, it says, well, don't put it every place. And the reason is, if you did put it every place, you're going to run out because there are only two sheets of these in there. And what he realized when they tried to assemble the model the first time is, oh, oh I've, I've only got uh, two sheets and I don't remember how many there are. Say there are 80 of those squares on here. And he had something like 120 places. You know, it's, it's marked on the map where they would go, all right? So then he says, oh shoot, now what do we do? So what he decided to do was go into the instructions. So the first, let me just get back on track and I'll finish my thought over here. So you build all of these according to the instructions and you get all the little plastic pieces, but they're just, just loose. they don't attach to the mat yet until you get the challenge. When the challenge was released on August 28th, then that told us how to use the dual lock to put it on the mat. And it's the people who tried to get ahead and put the dual lock on that are in trouble now because 
they put dual lock in every place it was marked, but they've used up more than half of their dual lock already, and they don't have enough to do the rest. So you've got two choices at this point. One, you can pay an arm and a leg, and you can go to Home Depot, and you can buy some more, because they do sell this stuff at the store, but it's really expensive. The other thing you can do is just pull it back up. As long as you don't get your fingers on it, you can peel it off and put it someplace else just fine. And so, the, since you're going to need to put it on top of another piece, you peel it off and you use some of the backing paper that was on the, the dual lock before, and you use that backing paper to push it down instead of your fingers. As long as you don't get your fingers on it too much, so you can use this stuff over and over again. But if you get your fingers on it, the grease off your fingers are going to get uh, uh, onto that adhesive and it's going to compromise it to the point where it won't work. So, you can remove it, you can put it back into deployment, but you have to use the wax tape. Now, what I do when I'm assembling these things, um, well, let me start with this here. When I'm working on the sheet, I use every other row and I put those onto my mat. So I end up with a strip of dual lock, and then a blank sheet, and then a strip, and then a blank strip. So every other strip has a dual lock on it. And then I cut it down with scissors so that when I'm done, it's too wide, and half of it has dual lock, and half of it doesn't. And then I rip them up into little squares like this. So on each square, one's got dual lock and one's got paper, and you can see those on the board when we go over there and take a look at it. So I put these on the top piece. I stick them on on the bottom, because you can do that without getting your fingers on it. But then when you're putting the top piece on, you want to put this on all the ones that are facing up. Then you line your model up carefully with the lines, and then you press it down on top of the sticky stuff. So you Wait till the just when you're ready to apply your model. Rip up all the paper covers, and then you put your model on it. Stick it on. And then when you pull it off, you can peel away the model from the dual lock very easily. So just we'll peel it away. It comes off just fine. You can steer it into the box. The great news is everything fits right back in the same box you started with. You start with the big platform, the big pieces. You lay them down face down in the bottom of the box. And the big tall piece, you have to slip in alongside of that. And everything else just kind of fits in there real easily. The only thing you have to do, because it's big in two different dimensions, you have to take these little uh, pieces here off. So you just pull them out and stick them in. And then when you're done, you put them back in when you're getting ready to set up. It's real easy to put those back on. Uh, everything else fits into the box. I always just get a big uh, freezer bag this year. One works. Last year we they took ten of them, I think. But this year, one big gallon size holds all of your loose pieces, so you can stick all of them in there. And then when you put that into your box, it keeps them from getting all over the place, getting lost in the piece in the box and stuff. All right. So, got all your models built. You did as much as you could do before the challenge was released. Now the challenge has been released, so we need to go back to our handout again. Put the mat on the board. So first thing it tells you to do about the mat is have the mat oriented to the south side. Now for those who are geographically impaired, there's actually a compass road right on the mat to tell you which way is north, which way is south. The side that the, that you're facing when you're looking at the mat and you can read it, that's the south side. And the opposite side is the north side, east and west. So the south side, when you look at it and you can read all the labels, that mat wants to be right against this wall. And it wants to be centered between the other two walls. And if the table has been built correctly, you should have about three eighths inch gap on both ends and on the other side. Now, some people, when they built this, they didn't really follow the instructions. They just built a table that fit the map. They thought that would be the right thing to do. And so their tables are too small. And what's really annoying is the folks at Legoland in their building shop, they gave them the instructions and they didn't follow the instructions. They built all their tables where we run our 
Open Championship and they run the championship at Legoland, all of their tables are built exactly the same size as the mat instead of the size they're supposed to be. So when you go there, if you've got something that depends on the distance between one side and the other side being a certain distance, you may be surprised. <laughs> Yeah, I'll take, take that bench out and bring some other chairs in instead. Yeah, that's a good idea too. Not very 